Welcome. I have two guests with me today, and one of them wants to know how we got to episode 250 without interviewing a single person from their organization, and that is a good question to ask. So we are thrilled to have both of our guests today. Giovanni Pallavicini is here, principal of the Flexible Office Solutions for Avis and Young, and a GWA board member, and... Giovanni worked at Regis in their real estate development group from 2012 to 2016, which we'll talk about later. And we have Wayne Berger, Chief Executive Officer of the Americas at IWG, which is the parent company of Regis and Spaces and a broad portfolio of brands, which we will also get to. So welcome to both of you. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Wayne, Gio, so I should set this up. Gio's here. He's sort of my co-host for this one. So Gio, <laughs> jump in anytime. Gio and I were at a board meeting for the Global Workspace Association about a month ago and caught up and chatted and he talked to Wayne and said, you know, Wayne really wants to to get more involved and, and connect. And so let's do an episode. So Gio, thanks for bringing Wayne into the fold and Wayne, thanks for, for joining us today. And Jamie, I, I'm proud to say that we can uh, be part of we, we can be part of episode 250. <laughs> so, totally. And thanks, thanks for having us, and uh, and and thanks to Geo for connecting us. It's exciting to be here today. Yeah, it'll be fun. So, it will be fun. Okay, Geo, since you're in the middle, where where are you today? I am actually in Dallas for uh, for once in the last four weeks. So I'm, <laughs> I'm glad to be say. home for a few days. You've been out and about. I missed you in San Francisco. You hit Seattle. You've been busy. Yes, sir. Okay, so when Gio has been on the podcast before, so we won't do the the deep dive on his background. So Wayne, before we dive into our deep list of questions, now that we have you uh, live and on the air, tell us a little bit. Tell us a little bit about you personally, so that we can warm up mm -hmm. to to Wayne, and then about your experience at IWG, kind of your progression through the organization. You've been there for eight years. Um, you mentioned in our pre-recording that you're more excited today than ever before. So we can't wait to hear more about that. So just tell us like where you came from, how'd you get involved in the industry um, and a little bit about, you know, wh where you are and, and uh, yeah, g give us the Wayne story. Yeah, absolutely, Jamie. So I'm, well, number one, I'm currently here in my office at Spaces The Junction in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. So I am Canadian uh, and uh, been, I just was thinking about this. I'm celebrating my 25th year in business, which kind of blows my mind. <laughs> 20 years as a people leader. Uh, and my career basically has been broken up into um, kind of like two halves, I would call it. I spent half my career in the US uh, living and working for a great company in some phenomenal cities. And then the other half has been back in Canada, which I was born, raised, went to school and started my career. Uh, so the last 10 years have been back here in Toronto. And, um, and, I, uh, and I would say that I've had a really wonderful career and, and I'm somebody that truly believes in treating your career as an adventure. There's so much opportunity for individuals uh, to be able to grow, not just professionally, but personally and socially, depending on where they live and, and uh, the teams they work with and the organizations that they have a chance to work with and support. So my, my 25 years has been a remarkable adventure. I'm looking forward to another 25, but I will tell you, I've been with the company. Now I've been with IWG uh, for eight years. And prior to IWG, I worked for a Fortune 100 company, a really wonderful company, great leadership, great global position um, in an industry that was a little bit more uh, probably mature in its economic life cycle. And, and to be honest, I got a phone call one day about eight years ago, and, and it was from an executive recruiter. And I, you know, when, when you think about sales, I constantly remind people of this. This person was so resilient and so persistent <laughs> wouldn't leave me alone and called me and emailed me and said, wait, just, just take a phone call. Let me explain to you. I've got this really unique opportunity. So I called this person back because I was so proud of their persistence. <laughs> you wanted to high five short, them. Six interviews later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was like, look, if anything, 
Your boss needs to know how persistent you are in your craft. <laughs> like you are a student of the game. And if you, like, we should at least talk for, t for 15 minutes. Those 15 minutes turned into six interviews with IWG, of which, by the way, none were live. And all were taking place in different co-working facilities with different individuals from around the world. And next thing you know, I was at a point where I thought, well, this is the next stage of my career. And I'm, I'm, I'm this invested uh, six interviews in and I joined the company and I joined, I joined IWG uh, leading our Canadian business. And our Canadian business at the time was 48 locations and under $50 million in revenue, good business overall. But, um, but it was amazing to see the opportunity. When I joined in 2014, I was frankly amazed with the opportunity in front of us in co-working and flex space. And you know, one of the first questions I asked myself was, why didn't I think of this? Like this is- Everybody you know, wants to know that when way, I, right? When I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> everybody except for, you know, my boss, who's the founder <laughs> who of IWG, think of it, right? who did think of it, Exactly, that's right. And um, and 32 years later, he's you know still incredibly actively involved in the business. And um, and I started uh, in this business, and it was amazing when I spoke with coworkers, when I spoke with uh, industry friends, uh, business associates, family members, journalists. The first question out of everybody's mouth back in 2014 was was what is this coworking thing? You always had to explain it. And it's remarkable to see what's taken place. And, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm 25 years in business and I've had an amazing adventure, but my last eight years at IWG have been electric. And over those eight years, I've grown from country manager leading our Canadian business. We, in five, the first five years, we tripled in size from 48 locations to 130 locations, over 3 million square feet across 48 cities. Um, I had a chance to support and lead our Latin American business across 25 countries, which was an unbelievable experience, both professionally and personally, helping re helping redirect that business and and, and drive growth in uh, in Latin America, which is a remarkable place that's going through urbanization at a faster rate than any other continent um, and and collection of countries. Uh, and then over the last two years, really at the start of the pandemic. I had an opportunity to uh, support our U.S. business, which is our largest business of over a thousand the start locations. Of the pandemic. Hey, Wayne. Right. Hey, oh, man. right. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. It's like, hey, there's a global pandemic taking place. We'd like you to dive in and look after a thousand locations and lead the team and clients through the unknown. <laughs> so, it was. Uh, I, I I will tell you. I, it, so today. In Canada, it marks the first day where I sit where vaccine passports are no longer needed. And restaurants just opened up a couple of weeks ago. So it's really amazing to look back over the last couple of years, especially in the US and across the Americas, in how we've had to pivot our business um, for, the, for the short term to ensure that we were well positioned. And then also continue to focus on accelerating the growth mission long term. Because what's amazing is even over the last couple of years, the future in flex and co-working is dramatically, dramatically bright. And and even through these last couple of years, which which have been the most challenging that I've experienced in 25 years, uh, I've never been more excited about the future. And and it's it's more than just about the business proposition and the opportunity that's taking place within co-working flexible workspace, it's also the impact we can have on, on workers and humans. You know, there are 2 billion knowledge-based workers around the world, all that need an amazing place to be, frankly live and work every single day. And I'm sure we'll get into a number of trends that we're seeing, but, but what's interesting is moving forward at a greater pace than ever before, Flexible workspace and co-working is going to be the absolute gathering place and home for those 2 billion base workers uh, and, and more as we continue forward. So uh, I, I, I say to Gio at, all the time and, and contemporaries in the industry, I am an absolute ambassador of flexible workspace and co-working. We're still literally the bottom of the first inning 
in this industry. Oh, I love sector. that analogy. People ask me that all the time. Oh. What inning are we in? Sometimes I say like we, third. You think bottom of the first. Right? We reset, J Jamie. Jamie, <laughs> J Jamie, I, I do. I honestly do. I, I look at our business. You know, today we operate 30 million square feet of space just in the U.S. alone. It's fractional. It's fra we could we could grow 10x in our in in in, um, in our industry right now in the U.S. And that would absorb 1% of yeah. commercial real estate. Yeah. It is amazing. And for all the financial and structural and, 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 and wellness related, environmental related reasons, we're all moving towards this. So I truly believe we're still in the bottom of the first inning of this sector. And I remind every person, every team member that I support every day, I constantly try to remind them it's rare for people in their career ever to work in a in a business or an industry that frankly is so visionary right it's it's really remarkable we have a greater mission together right and and it's really incredible like right down to that day-to-day -day client experience it's so so important for our clients and companies and really for people as they continue to transition and redefine what work and workplace means. It's really, really remarkable. So I, I gotta say like, I am deeply excited about the future. And and my goal is always going to bed on Sunday, excited about Monday. Like that's my goal for everybody that I have a chance to work with and partner with and support even for myself. Um, and <laughs> I'm even more excited today when Sunday hits, going to bed on Monday, getting ready for the next week because, uh, because of what's in front of us of opportunity we talk a lot about the sunday blues in my household so it's <laughs> exactly you gotta love what you do and i think yeah it, i mean Wayne, it's, it's great to hear that from you because i think and it, i think that's one of the fun reasons to, to get you on the podcast is the industry and a lot of my listeners the industry is made up a lot of independent folks right we've got iwg yes. we work industrious and then boop, you know, lots and lots of small players who are in it for the reasons you just talked about. They want to make an impact. They care about the environment. They care about, you know, well-being. So I just, I like, it, it's fun to hear that language from you because we're all, it's different scale, but in it for yeah. similar reasons, right? Well, you're right, Jamie. If you think about, if you take a look at high growth industries and high growth sectors over decades, um, if you look at where we are today, in flexible workspace and co-working, we fit the definition. And so high growth industries, high growth sectors are traditionally highly fragmented, a lot of entries, right? Looking for ways to build a great business yeah. and a great community. So if you look across, let's just talk the US alone. Today, you have thousands of operators. And the average operator, including IWG, we work industrious, serendipity, you know, all the, the, you know, let's call them the larger players. Um, the average operator operates 1.3 locations. It's incredible, right? So, so there's still a deep level of fragmentation. And the reason why there is, is because people, organizations, you know, whether it's private equity firms to VCs, right down to individuals looking to diversify their business or, 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 or open a new business, they see the opportunity in flex, right? So th this is what's happening right now. It's, there's so much fragmentation, but it's gonna be interesting to see what happens over the next 10 years. I think you're gonna see more consolidation. You're gonna see more growth within our business. And you're gonna see, frankly, just new players enter as well because, because of the shift structurally and how people are working. So let me ask you a question, Wayne. So outside yeah. of really the last, seven, eight years, the competition was really premier workspaces, which is relatively small compared to y'all and mom and pops. So how has these larger players that you just mentioned, Industrious WeWork and others, how have they driven you and your brand to new heights and to continue evolving? Well, Gio, I think it's a really good question. And there's a few ways. One is we've adopted and embraced a, a diversified brand strategy. That's been a real critical element. Because if you think about it, up until 2015, IWG was known as Regis. Mm -hmm. We had 3,000 locations around the world. They were, for the most part, 3,000 Regis locations. It was the world's largest network of flexible workspace locations. And then suddenly, 
uh, new players started popping up, right? I mean, you take a look at the WeWork phenomenon. You know, it's suddenly you had this organization that was growing, underpinned by billions of dollars of investment from SoftBank and the likes, uh, and they started shifting. They started shifting the vernacular, where co-working became more mainstream. There was this build out. Uh, there was this transition from a traditional, let's call it business center or office setting yeah. to more of this emotional connectivity, to space. And that was really powerful. And we had to take a look at ourselves. Remember, 30 years ago, Regis would have been incredibly, incredibly vogue and very new, <laughs> right? And, and, and very novel, right? It's so... So you continue to shift and you build a business over time and you build this global network. That way you give companies and people ubiquity of optionality. That's a real key piece. And also confidence in knowing what you're going to, what you're going to walk into, whether it's in Dubai, Honduras, or San Francisco, right? So, but all of a sudden the, the sector started changing. And the one thing we learned really quickly was we couldn't, design new designs under one consistent brand because the expectation of a brand is already established with your client base so, so for example want the region never right? launch spaces <laughs> yeah bingo oh jamie you are exactly right if we would have opened up spaces and put a regis logo on those buildings <laughs> it would have confused <laughs> our client base <laughs> yeah yeah, for, absolutely. Some would have been really interested thinking about wow, this is like yeah, been interesting and cool and others would have said glass instead of drywall something's really wrong here right so 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 we we incorporated and we launched a diversified brand strategy so we we had been acquiring different brands over the years primarily just on underpinned financials right so the fundamentals made sense let's acquire and let's build uh because we were growing organically and we're going through acquisition and suddenly we had these really interesting cool brands as well so we started launching our diversified brand strategy in which today we have 20 brands, but we really have like five core global brands. And what that does is one, it helped us serve an underrepresented market that wasn't necessarily driven towards our traditional brands. So you look at spaces as a great example. We had a chance to acquire spaces roughly about 12 years ago. That brand today is a brand that's brand and a business that is well over a billion dollars in revenue, highly profitable, located across, I think it's close to 80 countries today, uh, hundreds of cities. And that brand continues to grow alongside a brand like Regis, which frankly is still our fastest, it's interesting, it's still the fastest growing brand location to location. And so now you have a diversified brand strategy and then you incorporate brands like HQ, Signature, The Wing, clubhouse open office what that does is it gives our clients our seven million members choice where they're able to choose the design that they're looking for they're able to choose location in terms of proximity to their house or to their team members or to their clients they can choose based on price they can choose based on amenities as well so for example our largest spaces location is spaces la defense in france it's 200,000 square feet it's you know loaded with amenities we have a location we have a spaces queen west here in toronto or you look at our spaces number of our spaces in new york there's everything from fully functional cafes right through the rooftop patios right there's there are you know these these locations are ecosystems that have eight to ten different working environments where where people throughout the day can shift where, when, and how they need to work depending on what's required, right? So diversified brand strategy gives optionality for our clients. It gives optionality for our enterprise clients as well so they can make the right investments depending on the types of teams that they want to place in different space. And then it gives optionality for our partners. So our landlord partners, our yeah. franchise partners, individual investors, it gives them optionality because different types of brands have different capital requirements. They have different size requirements. They have different build-out requirements, right? So, and one thing, one last thing about the, about the brand strategy is maybe up until about a month ago, IWG was the only operator in the flex-based co-working industry that had a diversified brand strategy. So this is like the Marriott Bonvoy type of approach. Different choice for different people for different reasons. It's 
shifting to more of a purpose-driven world around work and place. It's really, really critical. And it's a major differentiator. So that, that, that I would say was one of the biggest shifts that we've seen overall geo. The other big piece was we were a company, multi-billion dollars, that was absolutely incredible at industrializing the approach and building the, the approach around the client experience and the team member experience when it came to flexible workspace and co-working. But I think over the last five years, we've really assumed a greater thought leadership position as well, because, because we were so busy, we're so focused on our business, trying to become better every day and also just learning from mistakes that happen because it's going to happen in organizations that we started making the shift where we, 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 we knew that we knew that focus was still really critical, right? It almost goes back to the old good to great book, you know, Fox versus Hedgehog. You know, we were a hedgehog focused on driving our core attributes and our core objectives. But we also recognize that this industry is growing fast. And what's happening is companies and, and workers, whether it's freelancers, startups, scale ups, or just individual workers every day who work for an organization, they were craving more than just great space. They wanted community, they wanted guidance, they wanted tools, they wanted, they wanted, they wanted ways to be able to grow their professional network, their social network, and they wanted thought leadership. So that became a real critical element for us as well. So those are some ways that we've been trying to shift here over time. And then look, lastly, it's also, it's starting to shift from being a location-based business to becoming more of a platform-based business. It's a really critical critical piece that like we have today. We we have thirty six hundred locations around the world, um, with you know significant portion of those that are uh, that are underpinned by by leaseholds, which makes sense. It's a great return on net capital business, um, and um, but we also have a fast growing partnership business. And then also what we're seeing is, you know, it's interesting. We are commercial real estate is absolutely moving towards this true space of the service. We've all been talking about it for 10 years. We've all been at these, you know, Createch me, uh, conferences and PropTech conferences, and we've all been, you know, looking at the forecast and what's gonna happen. It, it's happening now, right? And companies and people, they want to access space as cleanly as through their app, right? It's becoming that simple, that flexible. So we are absolutely determined to make sure that the platform is in place where it doesn't matter who the provider is and who the client is. They turn to one platform and access space. And that space, that platform is underpinned by AWG. That's the goal. Wayne, you have such a unique perspective globally of kind of what's happening. I think you've had an interesting experience being in Toronto, which is one of the more conservative. Yeah. We have a lot yeah. of folks from Canada who listen, and I work with a number of operators in Toronto. And it's just like, wait, you're still... Closed? How could this be? You know, and yet you're exposed to the global, you know, different speeds at which the um, recovery is happening. But I'm curious when you look at sort of your your portfolio of brands and and maybe how what was on a positive trajectory before COVID. What's is there anything different now? Is there like a any consumer behavior shift that you're seeing that's like accelerating? you know, differently than you might have expected or, you know, any of those brands sitting in that portfolio that you're saying, oh, this, this is going to go, like, take off. I'm, I'm curious what, yeah. what you're seeing because you have such a unique perspective. We're, we're, so we're seeing a few things, Jamie. Um, number one is we're seeing this need for membership grow at a faster pace than we ever have. So what we're seeing right now is we're seeing companies really start to look at space differently. So we're seeing a number of companies rationalize, rationalize their real estate portfolio. So they're looking to say, look, we know we're going to, we know we still need a gathering place. We know an HQ is important. The amount of space we need is going to be under question and also how the space looks is going to be under question. You know, what's funny is we're seeing many organizations start to shift their actual workspace to what a co-working or flex space <laughs> space looked like, you know, for the last year, for the last number of years. Yeah collaborative space, gathering space, hot desking, brainstorming space, space that becomes desirable and attractive to go to. You know, it's becoming this more experience-based world. You know, when I think about prior to the pandemic, 
you know, it was interesting. In Canada alone, we hosted 2,000 events in 2019. It was, I mean, and I'm, we're talking everything from networking events to, you know, the breakfast socials to happy hours, but right through to hosting NATO and the Canadian Armed Forces at their LGBTQ summit to documentary launches to, and I'm not kidding, we hosted weddings, bar mitzvahs, 50th anniversaries at a spaces location. Who would ever think they'd want to get married in office space, right? <laughs> so so the, the, the world has been combining, right? Which is really interesting. So so we, we were seeing this you know, fast growth in terms of business. There's no doubt about that. Um, but what we're seeing now over the last couple of years is, well, number one, we're seeing this shift away from the downtown centricity. Now, I do want to make mention, I'm a firm believer in the downtown course. This idea that the downtown's dead, it's just, it's such a misnomer, right? People want, I live downtown, I live in an urban market, but what's interesting is I now work for the most part out of a spaces that's a seven minute drive or bike ride from my house. I can walk there in 15 minutes, I can bike in seven minutes, and I can admit to all the members on this call, I've biked more to work the last two years than I ever have in my lifetime. I guess I think the last time I biked this much was when I was in high school, right? So uh, it's amazing how, and, and, and I'm on a subway ride away from my, what my traditional downtown office used to be at one of our Regis locations in downtown Toronto. I rarely go downtown. I, I now go for meetings that require my physical presence, right? So. So what we're seeing is, is a couple of things. We're seeing this shift where people are starting to use space very differently. So the, what we're seeing now is the typical work day where part of the day may be spent from home if it's head down work. Part of the day or part of the week, frankly, may be spent at, let's call it a corporate headquarters or a corporate office. But then you've got this really the 65 to 75% zone, which is the third place, right? The third place that was, you know, coined maybe what, 30 years ago by Starbucks, you know, this, this place to gather that wasn't home, wasn't work, right? The third place is the home for flex space and co-working, right? And, and that's become much more relative these days. So prior, prior to 2020, Many of our clients, even though we had a network of 3,000, 3,500 locations at the time, every IWG member, if they had a, an office in any of our locations, they had access to the globe. They could go to any other location, but rarely did, did they members actually, do it? actually yeah. leave their one location. Exactly. <laughs> but now what, what's happening now, though, is, is the network is becoming more accessible. So, so we're seeing companies, instead of just setting up and signing up for office space in a different location, uh, in any, any location, we're now seeing our membership product really start to explode. So we have this product we've had for 30 years and it was used occasionally, but, but in the last year, we've had 2 million memberships sign up for, for our enterprise membership, which basically is, is companies signing up like they would a Spotify or an Apple radio account uh, and basically paying a standard membership fee and just giving their team members access, access. to any physical workspace. Yep. Right, exactly, it's all access because what's happening now is companies, we're also seeing a big trend where companies are less reliant on hiring people specifically in one city or one location. You know, whereas Palo Alto was the place to be and by the way, it still will be a destination point now companies are, are, are opening up roles to remote and hybrid greater than ever before. We're seeing people with the ability to be able to live and work wherever they need to, wherever they need to live and work, right? So if they choose to live in Milwaukee, but want to work for a company in Miami, it's acceptable, right? And, and companies are now supporting their team members with access to flex space, right? So they're providing them with um, with monies or subsidies or signing them up for a co-working membership, et cetera. So, so we're seeing that type of, uh, that type of flexibility when it comes to, uh, when it comes to hiring practices. And it's not just city to city, state to state, it's, it's global access of talent. Um, we're seeing this ongoing boom in the suburbs, 
So I'll, I'll give you, you know, a couple of a couple of points. You know, we we we've undertaken a major major strategic launch around greatly accelerating our network. So our goal is to add a thousand new locations each year over the next number of years to absolutely grow the network. Beyond Wait, you gotta go. Today. You don't have time to be talking. Yeah, about this is. <laughs> We're getting ready to sign a location in Rockford, Illinois. Like this is a forget about just Manhattan, right? And but but the reason why Jamie is because it's bringing flex space yeah. to where, to the where people, people are, want right. to live. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Local economies are growing. Business business travel is predicted to be reduced by fifty percent. The focus on the environment is going to be the number one theme over the next ten years, and people want the ability to be able to really adapt towards the 15 minute, uh, yeah. the 15 minute uh, city, which is the ability to be able to live, work, and access all their amenities, their coffee shops, their restaurants, their service providers, within a five to 15 minute bike ride, right? So the commute is transitioning away. I, I can promise you, and I think, I know that you've got kids, I've got three kids. I guarantee you that my 10 month old will one day turn to me and say, dad, tell me about the time that you used to drive 90 minutes each way when you lived in Seattle or San Diego or Toronto, why would you be that foolish? <laughs> right? And I would say it's what we did, right? It's just what we did. Those days are over. So, so those are the types of things we're seeing. We've signed 2 million memberships in the last year because companies are shifting their attitudes towards where people need to work and and how they work every single day. Yeah. Hey, I just wanted to jump in really quickly before we continue with our discussion. If you're working on opening a co-working space, I wanna invite you to join me for my free masterclass, three behind the scenes secrets to opening a co-working space. If you're working on opening a co-working space, I wanna share the three decisions that I've seen successful operators make when they're creating their co-working business. The masterclass is totally free. It's about an hour and includes some Q&A. If you'd like to join me, you can register at everythingcoworking.com forward slash masterclass. If you already have a co-working space, I wanna make sure you know about Community Manager University. Community Manager University is a training and development platform for community managers, and it can be for owner operators. It has content training, resources, templates from day one to general manager. The platform includes many courses that cover the major buckets of the community manager role from community management, operations, sales and marketing, finance, and leadership. The content is laid out in a graduated learning path so the community manager can identify what content is most relevant to them depending on their experience and kind of jump in from there. We provide a live brand new training every single month for the community manager group. We also host a live Q&A call every single month so that the community managers can work through any challenges that they're having or opportunities, um, get ideas from other community managers, build their own peer network. We also have a private Slack group for the group. So if you're interested in learning more, you can go to everythingcoworking.com forward slash community manager. Now, Wayne, I'm curious. To me, that's evidence that there is a little bit of a mindset shift. I feel like, you know, you go to the work techs and, and sort of the corporate real estate. They, I feel like you see this sort of attitude that's stuck in, you're either at home or you're at work. <laughs> and that the, uh, the employee yeah. is so happy, to your point, to, to not be commuting 90 minutes each way, that they're not waving their hand and saying, I need to... I need somewhere else, right? And you, I need you to pay for it. Are you seeing that mindset shift? Like the 2 million membership seems like evidence that bigger companies are saying, we don't need you to be only at home or only at the office. Like this recognition, yeah. of, there's something in between. Well, I, I think there's a few things to, to, to absolutely agree with you, Jamie. So one, um, it's interesting. So Johnson Controls released a study back in 2015 that talked about the future of work. And they, they, they conducted studies from 1990 to 2015 to look at the last 25 years. And they took that and then applied it to the next 25 years. And I remember there were a few major trends that they talked about. And this, this is one of these studies from, you know, futurists from around the world that there's some things you can relate to and some things you would think there's no way this is going to happen. 
Right? Like one of them was, for example, you know, the full time job was completely dead. You know, full time job yeah. will not exist in twenty four. Right. Everybody will you know, be what's a free interesting agent. Is, right. Exactly. That's right. But you know what's interesting is freelancing now is forty seven percent of the American workforce. Like it's growing every single year. So it's one of those things you continue to see. Urbanization is shifting. And one of the key elements that I struggled with in really adapting to back when that study was released was um, this notion of the greater commitment to health and wellness. And if you look at what's taken place over the last two years, health and wellness is more paradigm than ever before. You know, we've all talked about the great resignation. We're looking at what's taking place here with um, with what's happening with companies and people and wellness and and in the environment. And suddenly this is absolutely shifting. So companies are recognizing that the health and wellness of their future employees and current team members is absolutely critical, not just, not just for, their, for, the, for the constituents of the team members they serve, but also for the health of their business moving forward. That's a major, major piece. Yeah. And, and if you take a look at the stats, only 11% of workers actually want to work from home full time. Very few people want to work from home every single day because we're social beings by nature. We value and crave the ability to connect together, right? And then, but only 21% of workers want to go to an office five days a week dealing with that commute. It feels very unpurposeful. You know, here we are connecting via our laptops and our phones, et cetera, in a studio. It's really powerful. It's really engaging. And the funny thing is, you look at technology, we think about technology today as Zoom, Teams, here's the studio Riverside. Technology five years from now mm. is gonna be remarkable. It's gonna be immersive, 4D, all those elements that are coming into the mix. Like you look at the latest products from Google and how they're building an immersive environment where we could feel like we're together in the same room is right around the corner. So. So when you think about 11% of people who want to actually work from home and only 21% that want to actually go to an office, what, what workers around the world are saying is, look, choice and flexibility is what I took from the last two years. We all at a point had to work from home, had to focus on urgency and productivity, keeping things moving while we battled the pandemic. The reality is that gave us some benefits. It gave us time with our families. It gave us back for some of us, two, three hours a day that wasn't stuck commuting somewhere. It gave us the ability to make some choices in life. Well, frankly, many of us worked harder, right? So, but we had a different balance, we had a different type of control that we've never seen before in our schedules. And that is a driving factor in how companies will have to attract and retain talent. So. Companies are absolutely saying, look, we understand that working from home is not, is not the best situation. And also, now that we're starting to transition out, I think there's a greater heightened sense of also understanding security of technology, right? There's a real commitment on confidentiality, confidentiality and proprietary information. So now it's this notion of really supporting that 15 minute, minute concept and giving people the ability to access space and plan their day and their space around their day. I, I, the most progressive companies we're seeing right now are not saying hybrid means come back to the office two days a week and here's the two days we'd like to see you. The most progressive companies are saying, look, hybrid is about true flexibility, right? And we want you to be able to work purposefully every single day and space is ubiquitous. And we want you to be able to come back to an office when there's time for moments of togetherness. Like for example, we want to get together for a one-on-one -on -one that makes sense live, or we want to brainstorm, or there's an opportunity for a town hall, or there's an opportunity to innovate. Those, those are elements that, that are valuable live, right? So it's really becoming more purposeful. The last big piece we're seeing that I think some people are talking about and that companies are absolutely focused on we talk to enterprise, we, we work with 83% of the enterprise clients globally. Every single enterprise client is talking about one of the same things. How do I rationalize my real estate portfolio? Because space today is absolutely looking a lot different than what it was a couple of years ago. And the funny thing is, if you talk to many of these companies, they are already taking the steps, 
right? Moving away from this idea of having such a large capital lease intensive real estate portfolio uh, uh, as, a, as a significant capital expense, right? They've, they've seen the value of flexibility, but what's happened now is these last two years has just accelerated it. They know they can access great space, frankly, for something as flexible as even a one day membership, let alone a 10 year or five year, five year lease, right? So that financial savings that hits the bottom line directly. And it, it's not just the lease costs, it's the build out costs, it's the capital required for infrastructure, it's the facilities management costs. The latest study I just saw was really interesting. It, um, it demonstrated companies that are uh, moving towards flexible workspace, uh, which are flexible working philosophies, which 88% of companies are, they can see an $11,000 reduction in cost per employee by having their teams work flexibly at least half the week. Financial savings are remarkable. And that's also gonna shift the commercial real estate market to become more amenitized than ever before and seek partners to a greater ex extent than ever before. Yeah, so I, I love it. You've, you've touched on a bunch of the trends that, that we've discussed and we see I mean, obviously the suburban markets are growing and the need to be close to oh, the 15 yeah. minute commute, technology and how important that is, retention of talent. Um, and then overall enterprise is headed that direction of, of spreading out their portfolio and diversifying it amongst multiple things. In addition to, you, you touched on programming and amenization, right? I mean, that's huge. My question for you would be, and obviously you don't have to mention names, but can you give us some examples of some of your enterprises that you guys serve, which is a huge number of kind of how y'all have been able to help them pivot their portfolio to, to serve those needs? Yeah, it's a good question. Obviously, I think we always have to be sensitive towards names and because uh, um, for all yeah. those reasons, but you can imagine, Gio, um, if you take a look across sector, what, actually, this is an interesting trend that we're seeing shift. So if you think about the largest tech providers, all clients, there are some of our largest clients are certainly some of the largest tech companies around the globe. Um, but then you're starting to see this real shift where government, mm -hmm. financial services, um, consulting has always been a very large, uh, very large client uh, overall for the whole host of reasons that we talked about earlier. Um, we're seeing a, a lot of movement uh, from client base within that. Um, but then we're seeing pharmaceuticals. And then also, it's interesting, manufacturing. Mm. Now, what's interesting with manufacturing is manufacturing, you, you, you have a sector where there are, that is a sector where there is a, a proportion of the workforce that does require to be at a physical location. But what's interesting is there's a whole subset of people. Like think about Ford, for example. Ford recently announced that 76,000 of their team members now have the ability to work flexibly because those are individuals that do not necessarily have to be working in a manufacturing facility. But traditionally, organizations like that looked at their employee base in one definition. They all need a place to work. Let's get them in a Ford office, right? That's shifting. Um, a couple of key names that I will mention for sure is, and some of these will be global in nature, and these are companies that have started to really embrace the membership program are companies like Dell, uh, Staples, Nestle, uh, Standard Charter, NTT. Uh, that group alone, that group of, 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 of companies have, uh, have signed up for more than 500,000 memberships, wow. right? So and that's just Great. five companies, right? And the number continues to grow. Um, IBM has been shifting quite a bit. It's really interesting with some of their spinoff businesses. So. The, uh, I, I hope that helps, but you know, we're seeing that number continue to grow. And, and now what we're seeing is we're really, we're really trying to support that, that next phase of organizations, right? As you know, let's call them the mid caps and the scale ups, you know, sometimes mid caps and scale ups start thinking about dedicated space for a whole host of reasons. And part of it, like nothing's wrong with this is saying, look, we, our space is a demonstration of success, right? It's we have our space now and this notion of, you know, of having a you know, sign on the building, et cetera. A lot of those companies are starting to take a step back and say, look, you know, what business are we in? Are we in the business of managing space? No, our business is core competency, 
right, that we have to continue to focus on. And we're going to be a stronger business by keeping ourselves flexible. Look at a company like Shopify, which is one of the largest tech companies in the world. It happens to be a Canadian company. They've grown exponentially, as, as you both know, over the last five years. Toby Lukey, who's the founder and CEO, had recently come out saying, you know, from now on, um, Shopify is a digital by default company. Right? Every team member at Shopify can work wherever they need to work in order to get the job done, whether that's a Shopify office, whether that's at home, whether that's in a flex space, whether that's in a van traveling across the country. Right? It doesn't matter as long as they achieve their productivity goals. And how is we will... Go ahead, Jamie. Oh, no. Like, it's a huge, huge shift in mindset, right? That's a big... And, right, we'll see others following. And even just the, yeah, the, the choice, the ability to choose where to work. Um, yeah. Geo, jump in and then I, 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 wrap up. Yeah. How, how is IWG embracing that from a corporate standpoint? Are y'all obviously making shifts and transitions? I mean, obviously... As Jamie said, I was with, with Regis for a while. And at one point, we were pushing everyone to move to Dallas. And then, obviously, there's been a huge shift in transition, especially in the last two years. So how are you and your team shifting from a corporate standpoint? So I think it's a really good question, Gio. I mean, and I think I'm probably a good example of that. You know, here I am. I'm CEO of a business that is primarily U.S. and U.S.-centric. And I live in Toronto. So, so if I, if I look at, you know, my region, for example, you know, I support 1,200 locations. It's a $1.2 billion business. We have a team of roughly 3,000 people. Uh, and, and, and the lion's share of that is in the U.S. And, and I have an opportunity to support and manage that business from, uh, from Toronto, Canada. Right? So... And if I look at, you know, my direct reports, my direct reports span, for the most part, most of them are in the U.S., if not in Latin America and South America. I have a handful of direct reports in Canada, right? That's it. But I'm constantly engaging. We're constantly engaging together via, you know, whether it's especially the last two years via technology. And we get and then we get together physically live when it makes sense. Right, like when it's absolutely critical, or frankly, when we need to or want to, then we gather. Right, so, so at IWG, it's it, we. It's interesting you ask the question. We made the decision to move forward as a mission where every one of our positions that that can be is hybrid. Every one of our positions that are that are posted are available for anybody around the world to apply for. Mm. So, so good example. You worked out of our Dallas office at a time we had obviously our large IWG Direct, which is a large customer service inside sales organization, traditionally housed together in uh, in our call center in Dallas, and that call center was also replicated in other countries around the world because we have twenty four seven coverage for our clients, but. But now most of our IWG agents have the ability to work from home. We've established technology for them where they're able to work from home or work from a flex space location or work from the office. It's really about choice. We want to make sure that if we're going to tout and if we're going to promote and if we're going to try to take the leadership on this renaissance, and I mean, this is a renaissance for workers that we haven't seen since the last hundred years. If we're going to take a leadership position in that, we need to culturally be leaders as well. So, for example, when we post a position for a marketing role, for example, that position's open. They, they do not need to be physically based anywhere because we would rather people have the opportunity to live a great life and be a productive member of our team, achieving and exceeding their goals, regardless of where they live. And frankly, it's great because now we have access to a global talent pool. So we, we're trying to live what we try to promote every day. Wait, I'm, awesome. gonna in, I'm gonna seek in one last question. You mentioned a thousand new locations a year. What does that growth strategy look like in terms of, is it lease, is it acquisition, is it partnering with landlords? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so, um, but but it's, in, it, it's exactly that, Jamie. So a few things, one, um, it's, it's definitely still growing within our conventional leasing business, but, but it's important to know 
it's only for the most opportunistic only for the most opportunistic locations right this is really critical i i I think we're still in the early days of some fundamental shift in what's taking place in commercial real estate. Um, and I think we're going to see that shadow effect for a number of years and markets going to respond differently than others. Um, so we're in as a global company, you know, we're we do have one of the we have the benefit and also just the challenge of constantly looking to source the best locations that make most sense if we're going to underpin those with capital to invest in both a lease and a build out, right? So that's that's part of the strategy, but it's the smallest part of the strategy. So that will represent 10% of that growth plan, um, which is still actually a healthy number if you look at it. I look back at, I think it was 2019, we invested over a billion dollars in capital and we still couldn't keep up with the demand, right? So the reality is in order to in order to keep up with the demand that, that is back, if not surging beyond pre-COVID uh, conditions, um, we're growing with partnerships. So we've got our conventional lease strategy, but then we also have, I'd say two very, very important strategies. And that is through our partnerships with landlords. Um, and I think that will drive probably 80% of that thousand location growth. And that's working with a landlord having a chance to establish and activate an amazing IWG flex space, whether it's a Regis, a Spaces, a Wing, a, a, a Signature, um, and that landlord has the opportunity to invest the capital. We have a chance to partner together and they drive a premium on their uh, product. Um, and, and frankly, uh, drive a premium on what a conventional lease would have paid out, right? So that way there's risk and reward for, for both parties, right? So, and we'll manage that as part of the brand, we'll fill it up, will drive and activate an amazing location. And that gives the landlord an opportunity to expand that from one building across a number of buildings in the portfolio. So there's that. So there's the landlord partnership program. Um, and then there's also our franchise uh, program as well. We're seeing we're seeing an accelerated interest around franchise. Um, for, and, and, and interestingly enough, from large institutional groups and sophisticated franchise operators who have who have invested or continue to invest in in other industries like restaurant, fitness, hotel. You know, those three industries and sectors have seen you know, a significant amount of impact over the last couple of years with the pandemic. And what we're seeing now are these sophisticated investors starting to look to say, okay, I want to continue to grow. I've got capital to invest. I need to diversify my I need to ver- diversify my my uh, my investment. And and they're looking at flex space. You know, we've all we've all talked about the JLL numbers. You know, the fact that we anticipate flex to be 30% of corporate real estate portfolios by 2030. Well, if you think about it today, we're 1.9. Like we talked about earlier, we could add, and we will, add 6,000 locations in the U.S. over the next six years. It will happen. And uh, and if it doesn't, let's get back on the podcast. We can talk about what happens. But no, just <laughs> kidding. But we will add 6,000 locations over the next six years. And that will inc- that will increase absorption rates by one percent. Uh, so so the franchise offering has been growing exponentially because franchise investors are looking to 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 really start to invest in a high growth industry that's going to give them great returns. So partnerships, franchise, conventional lease for the most opportunistic lease opportunities that are out there, and then also M um, and A. And so mergers and acquisitions, I mean, this, as we talked about earlier on, this is an industry that's growing at a hyper fast pace, which is amazing and exciting and electric. And, and is also represented above that of a highly fragmented industry. So I think there's some interesting opportunities to start looking at consolidation. And then the last piece I'm gonna make mention is we're really starting to shift um, towards this platform. You know, uh, uh, what's happening now is this used to be a location centric business at which you established a great community, you built a big, great business model, and then you scaled, right? And we've done that for 32 years. What's happening now though is it's really starting to move towards this platform. It's, it's really starting to shift towards prop tech or really this kind of Uberization or Airbnb of Flexspace, right? We, we as, you know, we as people are starting to see, you know, this behavioral shift that we have 
around how we select our vacations, how we select you know, our, 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 our day-to-day choice, right? Where platform is playing the key role, it's the aggregator. So we're focusing on really becoming that aggregator of choice more so than anything else. It isn't just about IWG space. It's frankly, it's about aggregating all space and giving people ultimate choice and ultimate flexibility based on the requirements that they have for that day or that year, right? So I think that aggregation of the network and really shifting towards a platform-based business that drives services beyond just space is a major focus for us over the next number of years. We could probably do a whole podcast episode on that. So we're going to wrap up because we are over, we're cutting into the next hour of your calendar. And Wayne at the beginning said, what, should we do like 30 minutes? And I was like, <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> I can go another hour. Gio and I are both probably have our yeah. list of questions we, we'd still love to ask. But Wayne, we'll let you go for this time. And we'll, uh, we'll invite you back to do a part two or a part three. So thank you for taking the time and kind of digging in high level around IWG's portfolio and what you're excited about in the future and, and just getting to know you, which is great because, yeah, you're we're, we're all part of the same exciting opportunity right now. So it's great to hear your perspective and uh, and we'd love to have you back and, and dive in into more detail. So thank you. And uh, yeah, have a thank good you, Jamie. rest of your day. Gio, thank you for co-hosting. We'll, we'll collaborate on part two. <laughs> Thank you, Gio. Thanks. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks for having me and, and all the best. It's been an absolute sincere pleasure and look forward to continuing our conversation and look forward to 2022 and all the adventures in front of us. Amen. Talk soon.